You asked, we listened. We're going back to the basics with a small block Chevy being built on a budget and valuable tech tips for tuning a carburetor. Welcome to Engine Power. We're super excited about this 2016 season. Now we received a lot of emails from you awesome viewers about projects you'd like to see. Now a lot of you guys want to see more budget builds while the other half wants to see more big power back on the engine dyno. Well we're here to satisfy both sides and we're starting with the basics. Small block Chevys will always be around as well as something to put them into. If you're working on a tight budget, there's nothing easier to build that will produce good power. So with your input, we're going to do just that. But we're also going to take care of the guys that Mike mentioned, and we're going to do this in a three-stage build, and we're calling it in-house power mouse. Stage one is going to be simple. We're using all catalog parts from Summit Racing and everything's set on a pretty strict budget, but that doesn't mean the parts won't perform. Summit has pro packs and combos, some of them we help design, that make it easier for you and have really good part selection. It doesn't get any easier to order either. We chose this pro pack engine kit that contains pretty much everything you need to complete a short block. This pro pack oil pump and pan kit was next on our list followed by the cam and lifter kit, and the cylinder heads are ordered as a pair and even come with rocker studs and guide plates. The rest of the goodies were ordered individually with dollar savings being priority. Instead of the hassle of finding a good block and having it machined, we opted for the Summit Racing fully machined iron four bolt main late model block. It's board and honed 30 thousandths over, a line honed, square decked, and came with cam bearings, freeze plugs, and oil gallery plugs already installed. Not bad for under 700 bucks. You'd at least spend that at a machine shop. Even though it's new, it still needs to be washed. Foreign matter and rust inhibitors are what we want to remove. Those are the items that will affect tolerances and assembly. If we didn't have the washer, we'd still clean it thoroughly with hot soapy water and a set of brushes. The block is shipped in ready to assemble form and we're going to put it together just like you would at home without any of the specialized things that we have. But the good news is with the Pro Packs, you don't need them. And that pack included the Summit Racing cast steel crankshaft. It has 350 journals, it's internally balanced and utilizes a two-piece rear main seal. Now normally we would measure the journals with a mic and we would dial bore gauge the mains in the block. But I'm going to show you how you can check the clearances yourself at home without them. And it starts with the main bearings. They are from Clevite and they're also included in the kit. They are a tri-metal design and are perfect for our application. First, lay the crank in place. No oil is applied because we're using this. It's called plastic gauge. Here's how it's used to determine our clearance. Cut a piece of plastic gauge between the reading scale. Open up the paper and carefully remove the thin green wax string inside and lay it on the crank's journal. Gently position the cap, seat it, and torque it to final spec. Remove the cap and use the scale to find your tolerance. Our reading is between two and three thousandths. Now the crank comes out, and with the cap installed and the bore gauge set to the crank's journal, we'll verify the plastic gauge's accuracy. It measures 27 ten thousandths, and that's within a half thousandths of our range. All you do is repeat that four more times and you're good to go. So is plastic gauge accurate if you don't have a set of mics? It is in my book and the important thing is that you're checking clearances to make sure that you're in the range you need to be so you don't burn anything up wasting your hard earned money you spent on this new bullet. Since our block is a late model Vortex set up for a one piece rear main seal and our crankshaft uses a two piece one, we're going to use this rear main seal adapter we got from Summit Racing. With the top piece aligned and fastened down, I can juice up the bearings with high viscosity assembly lube and carefully drop the crank into place. The caps also get the same treatment and they're seated with a dead blow hammer. Then they are all torqued to 70 pound feet on the inners and 65 pound feet on the outers using engine oil as a lube. Finally, the other half of the rear main seal adapter goes on. The thrust checks out at four thousandths. If you don't have a dial indicator, make sure the crank moves fore and aft a little bit. We're continuing on after this.
Welcome back to the stage one build of in-house Power Mouse. And so far, it's going really smooth. We have the crank in for good, but we still have plenty of parts from the Summit kit to put into this budget-built small block Chevrolet. We'll rotate the block to the upright position and install the cam at this time. It's a Summit Racing single pattern hydraulic flat tappet cam that has 218 degrees at 50 duration on both the intake and exhaust, plus it has 450 thousandths of valve lift as well. The lobe separation is a tight 106 degrees. Be sure to use the included cam lube on the lobes, which helps establish a wear pattern in the parts and prevents premature failure. Do not use oil here. When talking cam stuff, Single pattern means that the intake and exhaust duration degrees are the same. A split duration means that they are different. Next up is the double row timing chain assembly. The crank gear has multiple keyways to degree the cam in where you'd like it. A Pioneer roller cam button will keep the cam's thrust in check. It's not required for a flat tappet cam, but the roller cam in stage two will need it, so we're all set up for it. The bolts are torqued to 28 pound feet. In order to degree the cam, we have to assemble the pistons and rods using a heater like this. Now the small end gets heated up and expands so the pin can fit through it. As it contracts, it locks the pin in place. That's why they call it a press fit. Now, if you do this at home with a torch, you actually overheat the small end, causing distortion. Now that'll cause the pin to walk inside of the engine and make contact with the cylinder wall, causing catastrophic failure. So, you can make a quick trip to the machine shop and for less than 50 bucks have it done the right way. Here's how we do it. We're using our Goodson rod heater that runs off propane. With the flame adjusted, we'll place the small end of the rod on the rest. Let it heat up for about 20 seconds, then flip the rod so even heat is applied. When a heat line is halfway down the small end, it's ready. Now with a piston and pin waiting in the fixture, Align the small end with the pin and use a pusher to insert it. Hold it for about five seconds and that's it. Now you want free movement just like this. Now we'll drop the number one assembly in to find TDC. No rings are needed. Down low on the big end, the bearings are in but not for good. We have to check their clearances too. In this case, we're gonna put the cam in at 102 degrees of intake center line. This will promote more low-end torque since our RPM range is limited to under 6,000 RPM. With that done and some Loctite silicone on the block, an all-star timing cover from Summit will seal up the front of the engine. Ring packs that come with stock piston sets are normally pre-gapped, but they still need to be checked, all of them. Now what we're looking for for the top ring is four thousandths gap per inch of bore. Since we're working with a 4030 bore, we want at least 16 thousandths here. Now for the second ring, we want to open that up just a hair more to about 18 thousandths. First thing I'll do is place the ring in the bore, and then using a piston or a squaring tool like this, square the ring up. Using a 16 thousandths feeler gauge, I'll check the ring's gap. As you can see, it's a little loose, which isn't a bad thing. But if it was too tight, as the piston expands, the ring gap closes and butts together. When that happens, it'll literally rip the top of the piston right off. Now we have right at 21 thousandths, which is fine. Now there won't be any negative effect with that little bit of increase. It's pretty common in factory type rings. The best part for you guys without a ring filer, this works out perfect. Now I'm gonna go ahead and install the rings on all the pistons and get them in the bores. We'll be right back. All our rods and pistons are dropped in and our in-house power mouse build continues with this Summit Racing Pro Pack oil pan and pump kit. It has a built-in windage tray, a rear sump, and a trap door for more oil control. It also has a high-performance oil pump with the shaft and a one-piece oil pan gasket. First to go in is an included oil pump stud. Now the pump and pickup go into place, and we'll torque the nut to 50 pound-feet. The gasket can be placed on the pan rail. And finally, the pan. Securing it are grade eight fasteners. A Summit Racing Street Strip Bracket Racer SFI Balancer goes on next, and it's locked down with an ARP crank bolt. Here's a little backyard tech. We didn't have the correct timing pointer, so we made one work. By finding TDC with a dial indicator, 
we marked a pointer at zero, cut it with tin snips, bolted it down, and bent it into position. The first items for the top end are these aluminum Summit Racing cylinder heads. Now these are a Vortex style with a 170cc intake runner and a 69cc exhaust runner with a D-shaped port. Now underneath we have a 202 intake valve and a 1600 exhaust valve and they're both sitting in a 62cc combustion chamber. Now these heads flow right at 242 CFM at 500 and the valve springs are set up for a hydraulic flat tappet cam with less than 500 inch lift. These heads are much better than stock. Gaskets from the Pro Pack will seal them to the deck. These are quality Felpros and have a 39 thousandths compressed thickness. With the heads located on the dowels, we can drop in our lubed head bolts and torque them down to 70 pound feet. Next up are the hydraulically actuated, load following, push rod lifting, valve opening apparatuses or lifters. Now they're hydraulic flat tappets. Here's an FYI, the bottom of the lifter is not flat, it's actually rounded. Now that combined with the lifter center being slightly offset to the rear, about 20 thousandths, keeps the camshaft pushed to the rear of the block. Now that's why the cam button up front was not necessarily needed for this stage, like Pat mentioned earlier. Stock length 5 16 push rods are dropped through the head's guide plates and rest on the lifters. These roller rockers fit the budget theme. They're aluminum full rollers with a 1.6 ratio. They come with poly locks for less than 160 bucks. The setting for the intake and exhaust lash is half turn past zero. This Y-end accelerator single plane intake manifold will top off the heads. Its operating range is from 1500 to 6800 RPM. The rest was put on in here. Supply and Spark is a Protronics flamethrower HEI with a magnetic pickup and mechanical advance. It produces 42% more coil energy over stock HEIs. Supply and Fuel is a Holley 650 CFM HP, and Protronics 8mm flamethrower wires make the connection between the HEI and E3 spark plugs. Inch and three quarter Doug's long tube headers are our choice for this dyno session. We're starting with 30 degrees of total timing and using 93 octane in the fuel cell. This engine has a 10.25 to 1 compression ratio. All right, the first pull is going to be from 2500 to 4800 just to see how she acts. Just kidding. We have to take a quick break, but when we come back, we're doing our full dyno session and you'll see the results. Plus, how the pros tune a car. Sorry to make you wait. Here's that 25 to 4800 RPM pull. Nice. Sewing machine, smooth <laughs> as silk. 338 on power, 388 pound feet. Flat, flat torque curve. Still making good power and climbing. Let's look at the miracles. Wow. 377 pound feet from 41 to 4300. And at 48, it's only dumping down at 370. Gotta turn it higher. Wanna higher? 6,000? Sure. And 345, 377 on torque. Let's see, peak power, 5100. Peak torque, it held 377 pound feet from 4,000 to 4300. That is not too shabby for a little 355-inch uh, deal with a flat tapping in it. <laughs> um, well, we got to stab some timing on it, and uh, an intake needs a little plenty of volume. It absolutely does, and I hate to change in two things at once, but uh, timing and spacer. I think we'll do timing and spacer. All right, one-inch spacer, 36 degrees of timing, same RPM. Excellent. Here we go. Keep in mind, these TBI engines typically made around 200 horsepower from the factory. Not bad, not bad. 357 on power, 389 on torque. That is excellent, and excellent for cheap. This thing's got great vacuum. Uh, this is a 100,000 mile engine that uh, you could put it in a manual, automatic, wouldn't matter. This thing will run like a sewing machine forever. Peak power, 357 at 51. Torque was 389 at 43 and 4400. Sweet. That's a winner for the money. Nice job. 
Well, you asked for it and you got it. This is stage one of three and it was built on the cheap. The next one is gonna get better internals, more cubic inches and a top end kit that's gonna crank out some big numbers. And stage three will even be more spicy with an aftermarket block and a big power adder. And that's all we're gonna tell you for now. Trick Flow Specialties is sure to put a smile on all you big block Mopar owners with their new CNC PowerPort 240 aluminum cylinder head. It features a 240cc intake runner and a 76cc exhaust runner, and it also has a heart-shaped 78cc combustion chamber. The valves measure in at 2190 on the intake and 1760 on the hot side, and they're compatible with all pistons, rocker arms, intake manifolds, and headers. And the price for a complete set is only about two grand. If you're looking for a radiator conditioner due to high operating temps, or even looking for a defense against corrosion in your cooling system, Royal Purple's Purple Ice will help you out. Now this stuff reduces the surface tension of the coolant, allowing more heat to transfer outside of the radiator, allowing your engine to run cooler. Now when the directions are followed, this stuff will actually lower the coolant temps up to 22 degrees. Now you can find it at any of your local auto parts stores. Whether you run race gas, ethanol, or methanol, Mr. Gasket's Gravity Feed Microelectric Pump will work for you. It features state-of-the-art electronics and has no diaphragms or mechanical parts to wear out. It's internally regulated between 4 and 7 PSI and delivers 35 gallons per hour of flow with a simple two-wire 12-volt hookup. And it comes with mounting hardware, a 100 micron filter, and easy to follow instructions, all for around 50 bucks. You guys ask this question a lot through emails, and today we're gonna answer it. It takes a lot to get an engine up and running on the dyno. There's a lot of factors involved. One of them is getting the carburetor set up and tuned in so the engine runs smooth, and we're in a safe air fuel ratio range. Well, today we're gonna show you how we do it. And this goes for a carburetor that's brand new out of the box, or maybe something you're having a little bit of an issue with. With electronic fuel injection flooding the automotive market, some may think that carburetors are a thing of the past, well, I challenge you to go to your local drag strip or car show and count how many carbs that you see. Whether it's a nitrous car, a naturally aspirated door slammer, or just a nice hot rod, I bet you're still gonna see plenty of carbs. The culprit for today's tech is the 750 CFM quick fuel black diamond carburetor. Now this thing has mechanical secondaries, no choke, and no choke horn, making this a high performance drag race or oval track setup. It's safe to say no matter the application, the carb will require some adjustment out of the box. For the most part, there'll be minor ones. This engine is a mild built 350 small block Chevrolet, so I'm sure a lot of you can relate to it. Our starting point is setting the engine's curb idle speed, and that's determined by the part selection and the engine's purpose. This cam has a hydraulic flat tappet with a duration of 218 degrees at 50, so our target is gonna be 750 RPM. Hitting that target is done by adjusting the throttle blades using the adjustment screw or screws. Now some carbs have one for the front blades and one for the rear. With the engine not running, we'll completely close the throttle blades, then slightly open them about a quarter turn. Then start the engine and let it reach operating temperature. By turning it clockwise, it opens the blades, which increases the idle speed. Counterclockwise closes them, decreasing idle speed. Our target is set. The idle mixture is next. This carb has a four corner idle mixture setup. We like to run each screw in until it gently bottoms out, then back each one off one turn as a starting point. Hook up a vacuum gauge to a manifold vacuum port and adjust the screws evenly to achieve the highest vacuum reading. The idle speed will increase when this happens, so a slight idle speed adjustment can be done while this is going on. Keep repeating this process until your mixture screws are even and your vacuum is at its highest. Then you can back your idle speed down by turning the main idle screw for the last time. Using these few simple tools gets you to a good point for the rest of your tuning, and that means driving it if it's your street car or making passes with it if it's your race car, and that means changing jets and air bleeds, and we'll get to that another time. We hope you learned something or maybe got a little inspiration to get out in your garage and try the same type of build. Now stage two is gonna be packed full of power, so make sure you keep an eye out for it. We'll see you next time.